Good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? Great. Uh, my name is Adam Henderson. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Superflux Beer Company. I'm also a board member of the BC Craft Brewers Guild, so that's why I'm up here. And just wanted to welcome Evan to the stage. So Evan Singer is the national sales manager of Vessel Packaging. And Evan started in brewing with Molson Coors, spent three years in brewing operations and completed his diploma in brewing from the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. And Evan joined the BC Craft Beer community in 2016 as Parallel 49's production manager, where he oversaw packaging operations and a shift from bottles to cans as the primary packaging vessel. See what they did there? Uh, for the past three years, Evan has been working to support craft breweries across North America to optimize their can supply and canning operations. And uh, Evan also uh, has been a contestant on the show Jeopardy, um, which is awesome. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm very jealous of that one fact that was not on his bio, but I watched that episode. So uh, anyway, I'll turn it over to Evan and I hope you folks enjoy. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, uh, Jeopardy. It was uh, it was right before uh, the world shut down. It was uh, it was an interesting time. I think uh, I was looking forward to hanging out with a lot of you. I think I had a uh, had a viewing planned for uh, Brew Hall, uh, and and that was supposed to be March twenty twenty six. I want to say so. It was uh, it was an interesting time for sure. But uh, anyways, thanks everyone for uh, for coming. Uh, it's good to be uh, good to be back in uh, Vancouver. I was in. Uh, Ontario for the uh, Ontario Craft Brewers Conference uh, two weeks ago, and I got to say the reception was not nearly as uh, as good as this. So uh, great to great to be home and uh, and and with everybody in uh, in BC. Um, talking today a little bit about canning quality and kind of what we look for, um, both on a mobile canning perspective, but also um, uh, just just some some tips and tricks for for canning uh, in house. Uh, really, any uh, any kind of context. Um, so vessel, uh, I don't know. I uh, need much of an introduction here, but uh, we've we've been uh, you know the the uh, original mobile canner in uh, in BC and uh, with Sessions Craft Canning out east uh, across uh, across Canada, uh, rebranded vessel uh, uh, back in 2019 and uh, offering printed cans, blank cans, sleeved cans, labeled cans, mobile canning, and uh, and design services across Canada. Um, but uh, really what I'm uh, here to talk to today is uh, canning quality. Uh, what does quality mean? Why do you need to have a quality program with respect to packaging? Uh, and then what we like to refer to as the three pillars of, of canning quality, uh, oxygen, micro, and uh, seam control, and then how those uh, relate to mobile canning. Um, I don't think I need to sell anybody here on cans. Uh, cans are, are definitely the, the best packaging vessel for, uh, for, for beer. Um, um, across the country, I mean, there's been a massive, massive shift in the last, you know, last few years, and I think uh, hardly any breweries are, are not in cans to, to some extent, and I think uh, many breweries uh, have, have shifted almost entirely to cans, keeping uh, very few products in, uh, in bottle. Uh, from a quality perspective, uh, cans are better than glass. Uh, oxygen uh, permeability through the seam is going to be much, much lower. Any gas exchange through a can seam, as long as it's seamed properly, uh, compared to uh, a crown cork. Um, and no risk of any sort of light struck defects uh, through a can. Uh, totally light impermeable. Uh, even amber glass is going to let some, uh, some light through. From a sustainability and a cost perspective, cans are definitely superior to, uh, to glass with respect to the energy intensity of producing it, of recycling it, shipping it, and, and just all of the other packaging costs associated with it. So we'll get into uh, quality, and I think most, uh, you know, most if not all breweries will have a quality program set up, so I don't think uh, this is gonna be anything, uh, anything groundbreaking, but uh, you know, when I think of quality to me, it really is risk management. Um, every process has potential to fail, and put product out onto the market that, that frankly shouldn't, shouldn't be getting there. Um, it's really up to every brewery to define what is and isn't acceptable to go onto the market, um, and also what, is, what, what, you, what you're willing to invest in, in that risk mitigation. There's no way to totally eliminate any risk of, of any quality defects, but uh, there, there's gonna be an acceptable level of risk that's, tol that's tolerable versus what, what isn't. 
Um, quality assurance is making sure that you have process in place to, to keep quality standards where, where they need to be. And then quality control is executing those inspections that need to happen to make sure that your quality processes are doing what they're intended to do. Um, when it comes to canning quality, we're looking at oxygen control to make sure that as much oxygen is excluded from, from pickup related to the packaging process. Uh, microbiological control, making sure that the canning process is not a source of infection. We can't get rid of microbes that are already in there, but not bring in any new ones in. And then seam control, making sure that the can is sealed effectively to prevent any sort of leakage or, or other issues downstream with, uh, with the package product. So why have a quality program? It's really difficult to quantify the costs and, and the, the return on investment related to quality until you have a, uh, a recall or, or another issue that leads to uh, direct costs. But making sure that you measure the important uh, parameters with respect to canning quality, you can't control it if you can't, if you can't measure it. So dissolved oxygen, total packaged oxygen, um, seam specs, uh, microcontamination, need to have a way to measure these things or there's no way to, uh, to control them. Um, and then your program is really gonna define how you'd measure, how often you measure, uh, what the specifications are and what to do in case uh, you get a measurement that, that doesn't meet those uh, specifications. Um, one, of the, one of the key things that uh, needs to be part of any quality program is, is traceability. And, and there's, there's two big aspects to that. One is uh, coding packages to make sure that um, once it gets out to the market, you can trace back to the uh, production batch that it came from, uh, but also the internal records from, from canning, from testing. Um, you know, if you do have product that goes out to, uh, to market and, and you need to uh, initiate a recall, uh, how, how is that going to be controlled? How is, is the retailer or the distribution center going to know what needs to be quarantined, what needs to be, uh, what needs to be captured and, and returned to the brewery? And ultimately, every package should be, should be coded. Um, even if you're selling, um, you know, not as singles, uh, retailers will break up uh, cans into singles. Uh, retail, um, consumers may have a 12 pack and only keep uh, one bad can from it. So package level coding is key. Um, and then the date code itself, it could be from a day's production, it could be from a shift. Uh, depending on the speed of your line, it could be down to the, the minute or even second of, of production. And the more uh, often that code changes, the, the more you can isolate any product related that could potentially be related to, to a recall. Um, so going down to the smallest interval that you're comfortable with having to um, look at bringing back a batch of, uh, of product. Uh, and then in terms of the measurements, right, it's if you do have a recall in place and you have uh, two measurements to look at, one was good, one was not, that interval is going to determine how much you potentially have to quarantine if it hasn't left or go out into the market and recall if, if it's something that you're testing after the fact. So again, it's not practical or feasible to, to um, test every single package or you wouldn't have any product to send out to the market. Uh, but those frequent checks are going to be key in minimizing uh, the volume of product that does have to be uh, affected by any kind of recall. So making sure that the measurement from the last in-spec uh, measurement to the first out-of-spec measurement is really what's going to affect how much you have to um, quarantine. So I'll get into specifics related to, uh, to those pillars, oxygen, micro, and, uh, and seam. So uh, why do we care about oxygen control? Uh, oxygen is probably the number one factor related to, to shelf life. Uh, oxygen oxidizes. It, it, it creates a chemical reaction with... Um, uh, with compounds in beer, uh, malt will oxidize. Compounds in malt will turn into trans 2 nonanol which results in stale flavors. Uh, I'll start off as paper, get to cardboard, uh, all the way to caramel oxidation. You can see that in the taste and also the color. If you take a beer that hasn't been touched for for you know for months and check it over time, you'll see those changes happening over over time. Um, and then hops will oxidize. Separate from pre. Uh, fermentation oxidation where you might get cheesy notes. 
uh, oxygen in the beer, even if the hops were good going in, will mute a lot of those flavors and potentially create really unpleasant uh, bitterness from that. Um, ideally, in your in your fermentation process, all the oxygen that was introduced to the wort should be should be consumed. So, from the fermenter, you're essentially left with a, a blank slate of uh, ideally oxygen-free beer. But every process after fermentation that that beer goes through is a potential for oxygen uptake. So dry hopping, for example, uh, any sort of transfers, any sort of filtration processes, and, and most importantly, packaging. Um, once oxygen gets into beer, you can't really get it out. Uh, you know, there are some tricks like, uh, you know, purging with, with, or sparging with nitrogen, for example, that, that was something we did in Molson, but again, you have to have that source of nitrogen, and you're also going to be blowing off a lot of volatiles from, from hops and, and eliminating that flavor. So really, once the oxygen's in the beer, it's, it's not really coming out except by reacting with the beer to, to start oxidizing. Um, Oxidation is, uh, the speed of oxidation is going to be dependent on the concentration of oxygen and also on the temperature. So the colder uh, the beer is through the process, the, the slower that oxidation is going to take place. So uh, if you have trouble controlling oxygen or can't measure it, then it's, it's a lot safer to have beer stored cold throughout the supply chain from, uh, from packaging all the way through to, uh, to consumption. So how do we control oxidation and, and oxygen pickup? So first and foremost, don't, don't put it into the beer. It, it, sounds, it sounds simple and, and it, it is to, to some extent, but at the same time, there's lots of spots, is even, especially in the packaging process, where we can pick up uh, oxygen. So first off is making sure that any, anywhere beer is transferred through or into is totally purged of, of oxygen. Uh, lines can be packed with deaerated water and then pushed out with either CO2 or with beer. Uh, not really an effective or, or efficient, or, sorry, it's effective but not efficient with tanks. You don't want to necessarily fill up a full tank with water and then pull it, push it out with, um, with, with CO2. Um, you know, pretty big waste of water unless you're recovering it somewhere, but purging tanks with, with CO2. Um, purging cans with CO2, it's really important that this is done uh, effectively. CO2 is heavier than, than air, um, but we don't want the CO2 and air to mix in the can, so it'll be a gentle purge from the bottom up to make sure that we're getting out as much air and oxygen from, from that can. And then undercover gassing. As cans go through the can line, they're filled, and then before the lid is put on, CO2 is used to, to get a blanket over the beer, between the beer and the lid before it's, uh, it's put on. Uh, we want to make sure we're not picking up oxygen in the filling process, so making sure all the, all the gaskets in the line are seat, seated well, uh, in good condition, all the fittings are appropriately tight, and making sure there's no damage to hoses, uh, either the body of hoses or fittings, where oxygen could potentially be, come, could be coming in. You may not notice or see a, a leak um, or, or any sort of uh, bad seal, because as beer is flowing, it's going to act like a venturi and actually pull in oxygen from the outside. So even if, even if there is, uh, you know, a loss of integrity in the line, it may not show up as beer leaking out. Um, in the filling process itself, we want to make sure we minimize any oxygen pickup. So the fluid mechanics of the beer coming into the line, making sure that there's appropriate head pressure on the tank, that the, the, there's proper restriction in the line, and in the filler itself to make sure that it's a gentle fill and the speed of fill is appropriate. The more laminar that flow is, um, the less mixing there's going to be and the less oxygen that's going to get picked up in the can. Um, the speed of the fill, the position of the fill heads, the wild goose fillers we use, the fill heads start at the bottom and then start rising up through the can so that for the most part you're filling under the liquid level and that's going to prevent a lot of mixing with the oxygen that's in the uh, in the atmosphere. Um, one of the biggest sources of oxygen in, in finished cans is going to be the in the headspace. So any gap between beer and the, the lid uh, is, is a definite source of oxygen. So capping on fob, foam on beer, making sure that the fill is creating enough foam um, so that you have an appropriate level of liquid in the can, but that the rest of the headspace is filled with foam that will eventually collapse, but is going to push out any oxygen from that headspace. 
Uh, bubble breaking, making sure that foam does not have large bubbles that could contain oxygen. Uh, so there's actually a mechanical bubble breaker on the line. Uh, and then making sure that the transfer from fill to cap to seam is gentle, but uh, as short and quick as possible. So oxygen measurement, uh, there's a couple tools that we use um, to do that in uh, um, on site. Um, the gehaltimeter, we use a Hoffman's uh, Pentair gehaltimeter. This one is gonna measure both uh, oxygen and CO2 dissolved in, um, in, in liquid. Um, so it has a sensor that will detect the presence of oxygen and give a concentration um, of, of the oxygen in, in the beer. So we'll use this to test the tank uh, that the beer is coming out of. Uh, the packaging line and then in the package itself and we'll test the beer in package with a can piercer So the can piercer will hook up to the gehaltimeter uh, Create a seal and then use co2 to push that beer out into the gehaltimeter and in, in, a, in a closed environment so that it's not picking up oxygen on the way and and affecting that measurement um, So we'll test the packaging tank before we start filling um, once the, once the oxygen is in the beer, that DO that's in the tank, you can't really get below that in the, in the packaging process. So what we want to see is what is the baseline DO that's in that, in that beer. Um, is it appropriate to package even? And then we use that as a measurement to see how much is being picked up at other stages in the process. We'll test the line before the filler to make sure that all those, those fittings and hoses are, are tight, that there's nowhere in line that oxygen is being picked up. Um, we'll test before we start filling cans. And then if we start getting high readings and we're troubleshooting in line, um, then we'll start testing uh, at, before the filler as well. And then finally in the can. So we'll test DO and then we'll do a shaken DO to, to approximate TPO. So shaking the can for a certain uh, length of time at a certain uh, level of uh, shakiness. Uh, letting it sit and stabilize for, for a period and again making sure that we have processes that are that are set and repeatable for this so that the measurements make, make sense in context of each other. Um, and that will tell the DO will tell us how much oxygen is being picked up in the filling process and then the TPO will tell us how much additional oxygen is being picked up in, in the headspace. For any of these measurements, it's really important, again, to make sure that it's, it's done in a consistent process so that the measurements make sense uh, relative to each other. Um, DO is, a, is, a, is an absolute measure how much oxygen is in there, but depending on your filling process, you may have um, a different, you know, different threshold for that. Different breweries, different beer styles, you may have different thresholds for an acceptable level of oxygen based on your supply chain, based on the style of beer, the desired shelf life. Um, so really important to have consistent measurements to, um, to be able to baseline that. Um, but it's really important to test immediately after packaging. Oxidation is gonna start immediately, so sending the cans for testing elsewhere is not really going to be effective. You wanna do it as close to the filler as quickly as possible. Um, otherwise, you won't be getting consistent results. Okay, so next, uh, next pillar uh, is, is micro. Um, again, another factor in, in shelf life, this time from spoilage. So undesirable microbes are going to metabolize beer just like uh, yeast does, but potentially produce undesirable uh, flavors. Um, might not be typical for the style that you're going for, and then uh, those, those judges uh, at the BC Beer Awards aren't gonna, aren't gonna look too, uh, too kindly on that. Um, and, and re-fermentations, there's lots of microbes that will be able to ferment sugars that, that brewer's yeast can't. Uh, and then you're risking having that package sit on shelf and potentially building pressure and ultimately could, could explode if, um, uh, if there's too much sugar that can be fermented by any spoilers that are, that are present. Um, ideally, controlling inoculation, and that's what the, the majority of, of craft breweries are gonna do. Um, some beverages um, should have pasteurization. So anything uh, that's uh, supposed to have a, a quite extended shelf life, uh, low alcohol beers that aren't protected by the alcohol in the beer from any, any spoilers or, or even pathogens, uh, anything containing unfermented sugars that can't be controlled in, or packaged in a, a purely uh, sterile manner. 
um, might want to be pasteurized. Pasteurization has its own problems. Um, pasteurization will accelerate oxidation, so you're kind of creating one problem to potentially solve another. Uh, so really just making sure that the beer is as clean as possible going into can is the best, uh, uh, the best measure for, for anybody. Um, so brewing has a, a sterilization process built in with the, uh, you know, with the wort boil, but on the cold side, it's, it's incredibly important to make sure that there's no uh, additional risk of, of picking up any sort of micro contamination. Uh, any cold side additions need to be sanitary. Yeast can be a major source of uh, uh, contamination. Uh, dry hops could potentially, or, or any, any other pre or post fermentation additives can be introducing microbes that you don't want in your process. Uh, and again, just like oxygen pickup, any transfers, filtration, packaging processes can all be sources of, of micro contamination. At the filler itself, uh, making sure that we're minimizing that risk by a proper CIP uh, procedure. And when I say proper CIP, it's really making sure that we're following both the equipment manufacturers and the chemical uh, manufacturers guidelines for uh, concentration, time, temperature, agitation, making sure that those specifications are all met um, to, to get an optimal clean. Um, we avoid any, any risky exposure at our filler. So even though we have a CIP procedure, we'll validate that CIP procedure, but we don't can anything with, uh, with wild, uh, wild yeast uh, that we know of, any, any bacteria, live bacteria, um, diastatic yeast. Um, you know, we ask the breweries that we work with to, to validate, is there any of that present? And if we suspect there is, we don't really want to can it. We don't can live kombuchas because the, the SCOBY there is definitely going to be a beer spoiler. So assessing for yourself, what is the risk you're willing to take? Is your filler one that can be sterilized between running a clean beer and running a, a wild or sour beer, for example? Um, any inputs to the canning process could be a, a source of contamination. The cans themselves, uh, the rinse water used for cans, and, and even the CO2 if uh, any of those could be a source of uh, introduction for, uh, for micro-contamination. So the, the tool that we use to validate, uh, validate our CIP, and this is by no means a, um, you know, a, a, a sure um, proof that the, the line is, is sanitary, is uh, swabbing for, uh, for ATP and, and using a bioluminescence meter. Um, so ATP is a source of all cellular energy. Uh, if ATP is present somewhere, that implies that there is likely live biological material there. Um, so we'll test, we'll, we'll swab a surface that is believed to be clean. Um, the swab is then put into a medium that has a bioluminescent material. So the bioluminescent material will actually glow in the presence of ATP. So that swab and that media are put into the uh, bioluminescence meter and it will give a readout in, in relative light units. So this isn't an absolute measure, it's a relative measure, and it will glow relative to how much um, light is produced and how much ATP is, is present. This is really just a way to validate the, the effectiveness of the CIP, um, and it's, it's limited in the sense that you can only test exactly what you're swabbing. So, um, we swab the fill heads, um, the bubble breaker, uh, the, lid, the lid dispense, any of those high risk surfaces, um, but it's not possible to swab each and every nook and cranny of any, any beer contact surface. So it's a way of validating that the CIP was, was effective, but it doesn't prove that there is, is zero risk of any contamination. And that's part of the reason why we don't want to introduce anything that we know to be a beer spoiler um, to the line. Uh, we'll make sure the meter's working by testing a positive control, so swabbing a dirty surface, if it gets a zero reading out of that, that means that the meter's not working. So we'll always do a positive control to make sure that the meter is actually working and that the results, if we do get a zero off of the filler, that that's a, that's a good reading. Um, we'll test the inputs as well, so swabbing the inside of cans, swabbing the rinse water, uh, we'll bubble CO2 coming into the line through sterile water and swab that, just to make sure that the inputs are as, as clean as possible as well. Okay, last but not least, uh, seam control. Um, 
seam is really important to make sure that you're keeping what's in the can in the can and what's out of the can out of the can. So no oxygen is coming into the can after, after filling, no beer is, is leaking out or, or CO2 leaking out of the can. Um, you can put product on the shelf that's micro-contaminated or oxidized and not know about it, but leaky product does not stay on the shelf. Somebody will see that and, and pull it off. Um, so really, really important to make sure that seams are, are validated. Um, seam specs are tied to the end or the lid. They're not tied to the can. Um, a lot of, a lot of folks will mix and match ends and cans from different manufacturers. Definitely don't recommend this, uh, for a couple reasons. Um, from a liability perspective, uh, the can manufacturer and the end manufacturer, if it's not clear, uh, which one is liable for, for a production, uh, defect or failure are just going to point fingers at, at each other. So you don't have one supplier that you can hold accountable for. Uh, for a leak and trace it down to whether it's the can or or the uh, or the end and on the other on the other side of it um, Can flanges are sized industry standard, but the gauge of the aluminum may not be industry standard So the seam specs that one lid supplier is providing are specified to their can flange and their uh, Can flange thickness so a different thickness there is going to affect the seam and you may get measurements that are in spec, but not actually have uh, a good seam. Um, really important to make sure that with the ends, you have the specifications for the seams, as well as the seamer tooling. Um, so the tooling, the chuck, and the dies need to be specific to the ends themselves. There are three major types of tooling uh, available for, for beer cans. There's the LOE or B64, the industry standard end. Uh, there's a Crown proprietary one called a Super End, uh, and then there's a, um, uh, a CDL or CDL Plus that's produced by other manufacturers as well. Uh, they're not compatible with each other. They will all fit the same cans as long as the, the diameter is correct, um, but really important to make sure that you're not mixing and matching those with one set of tooling. LOE tooling, uh, super end tooling, CDL tooling are all going to be unique to those to those ends, and they will not produce a good seam with the wrong with the wrong end. Um, so, how do we control the seams? Again, making sure that the seaming tooling is is right, that the end size matches the can flange. If you try to put the wrong end on the wrong can, it won't work. If you try to seam with the wrong tooling on the wrong end, that will not work. Um, the engineering on the seaming uh, is, is key. Some seamer designs are, are prone to failure. Having um, a, a seamer with uh, pneumatic cylinders, for example, those are going to wear and need to be replaced a lot faster than a, than a cam-driven seamer. So making sure that the engineering is, is set up, that you're, you're going to be set up for success and not have to worry about parts failing um, prematurely. Uh, making sure that the tooling is high quality, um, it's the right materials, it's, it's recommended by the can or end manufacturer, um, and then also making sure that it's, it's inspected and replaced at, at regular maintenance. So uh, cleaning and lubricating uh, the seamer is going to be absolutely key in, in preventing any failures and, and having seams go out of spec, uh, making sure that parts, wear parts especially, are inspected and replaced at, uh, at regular intervals. Um, and then statistical control on the seam. So making sure that you're monitoring your seam measurements and looking for places where it may drift, right? The last thing we wanna do as a mobile canner is come in and have to shut down because we get out of spec measurements on, on seams. So we'll come back and look at the seamer over time and see are things at the center of the range? Are they drifting to one end or the other end? and doing that preventative maintenance to bring things back into spec even before they come out of spec. So there's, there's two main ways you can measure seams. Uh, one is through hand measurements, uh, micrometers, um, and, um, and, and those, those hand tools, um, and also precision uh, inspection equipment. Uh, with either one, you can either do a non-destructive or a destructive test. The non-destructive test is really just measuring the seam height and thickness from outside of the can. You can do that on any can and then let it go through the line. Uh, and this is a good way just to make sure there aren't any major failures in, in the seam over, over a run. 
Uh, we'll do a full teardown uh, destructive test, so actually open up the seam and measure not just those outside measurements, but also the body hook, the cover hook, the overlap, um, and make sure that those are all in spec as well at the start and the end of each run. Um, the, the vision system that we use, it's, it's manufactured by a company uh, called CMC Kunki, um, and there's a whole suite of equipment that it comes with. Um, the, uh, the, the core of that is, is a high magnification camera that will actually take a photo of the seam itself and measure the, the specs digitally. Um, the great thing about the vision system is that it, it really is accurate and precise. You'll get the same readings every time, regardless of if it's a different operator taking the, uh, taking the measurements, as long as they're all trained effectively. Uh, using a micrometer um, or, or uh, you know, hand tools, the measurement can actually affect, the, the, the act of measuring can affect the measurement. If somebody goes a little too hard on a thickness, they'll actually compress that seam and you won't have an accurate reading on the thickness or the height. Uh, different operators may have different spots where they're going to measure to, so it is possible to have a lot more uh, variance, a lot less precision and accuracy using those, those hand tools. Um, one of the greatest things about the vision system is the software that it comes with and the ability to track over time and do that statistical analysis without having to record, um, you know, seam specs manually. Um, so again, full teardown, start of the run, end of the run, and typically regular intervals during the run. And then the non-destructive tests will do very frequently every, you know, every few hundred cans just to make sure that nothing has, has gone out of spec uh, in that time. Um, we'll bring cans back to, to our warehouse after a canning run and do the, the Kunki uh, inspection and then log those results for that, for that statistical measurement. Um, in terms of troubleshooting seams, um, it's important that, uh, that you're able to get um, cans that are seamed fully but also just the first operation. The two seam operations are, are equally important in making a good seam and if the first operation is out of, out of whack, um, it's, it's impossible to produce a good seam and that's not something you can really troubleshoot just by looking at the finished seam. So um, one of the things a vessel can offer is, is sending us cans for testing. It's not something we can do with oxygen because the longer it sits, the, the less accurate the result is going to be. But if you are canning in-house and potentially having seam issues looking to troubleshoot, we're happy to take those cans and, and put it through the Kunki and help troubleshoot uh, you know, see if, if it's an issue with the first op, the second op, anything else that might be uh, an issue with the, um, with this, with the seamer. Uh, so going into uh, working, working with a mobile canner, um, it's really important to make sure that, that any vendor that you work with can at least provide the bare minimum with respect to having a QA, QC program, uh, making sure that it's documented making sure that they're sharing that with you. What are their processes and procedures related to, to quality? Uh, making sure that you get a report from the run that shows all of the, all the measurements they took, all the results, and what the specifications are for that. So you can make sure, are those specifications, um, you know, do they fit your quality standards and did those measurements all, all fit in there? Um, you wanna make sure they have the ability to test and, and measure these things. And, this equipment is going to be quite expensive. It's not something that every brewery is going to be able to, to afford. It's not something that every mobile canner uh, you know, may, may invest in. But having a, a gehaltometer to test oxygen, the can piercer, making sure that you're swabbing ATP, making sure that you're testing seams uh, in an effective uh, uh, manner. Uh, and then again, ideally, making sure that, they're, that you're comfortable with the products that they will and won't fill. If, uh, if you don't do any wild and sour beers and you don't want a can line coming in that might have had that in, in, uh, you know, in the line on the last run, making sure that that, that vendor is going to disclose what are the things they do can, don't can, what are the CIP procedures that they do potentially in between a, uh, you know, a, a spoiler, a product containing a spoiler versus, versus clean beer. Um, you know, like I said, we, you know, there's some equipment, there's some fillers that may be appropriate to run sour beers and then, and then clean beers, but it's, it's not something that we do with our, with our line. It's not something that we're, we're comfortable kind of passing on that risk. Um, and then again, for canning in house, just making sure that, um, operators have a full understanding of the importance of, of quality, 
what does it mean if a measurement is out of spec? What does it mean if this product gets out to the market? What's the implication potentially on the on the beer quality and ultimately on on the brewery? Um, and then investing in that quality equipment in house, um, making sure that you have the ability to measure any of these, you know, from oxygen to um, to micro to seams. So that is it. Uh, open for for any uh, any questions, uh, and I'll be around at the at the trade show as well. Come uh, come see us and say hi. Looking forward to uh, catching up with uh, with everybody that uh, haven't haven't seen in a while. <laughs> I'm I'm here. <laughs> I can, I end up I end up finishing second. I'm actually pretty I'm pretty bitter about this. Uh, the um, I was third coming I was third coming into Final Jeopardy, but it wasn't it wasn't a runaway. And I did the math and I was like, if both of them get it wrong and they wager what they should, I should be able to win. And sure enough, I got it wrong. The other person got it wrong, and then the woman who was in first got it wrong. But she didn't wager enough to to come lower. I asked her after, I was like, man, like, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you wager X to get you in first if you got it right? She's like, oh, I, that's what I was trying to do. I just did the math wrong. <laughs> so I was, a, I was a, it was a rough couple days for me after that for sure. But uh, no, it was a great, it was a great experience. Got to, got to meet Alex before he, uh, he passed, and uh, yeah, just uh, it was, it was awesome down there. Next time. Yeah, next, next time, next time. They did, they're doing a second chance tournament, but uh, they didn't invite me, so uh, you know, it is, is what it is. <laughs> Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough. I think I think the idea is that it's it's going to be a relative measurement. It may not be as accurate, um, but if you run it the same way, the you know, relatively speaking, the measurement should be should be good. So we're still going to go through the same procedures that we do, measuring tank, measuring line, measuring at the, at the filler and in can, and, and really looking for the difference in that, in that measurement. So making sure it's running through it at the same speed, the temperature is the same, um, just, just so that, you know, even if it's not, uh, even if it's not accurate, it's precise, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. 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 No, not yeah, yeah, I don't think we we typically see a drop from from tank to package. Um uh, but it, Yeah. No, exactly. So yeah, in terms of, in terms of hazies, anything, yeah, anything that that could affect that that optical sensor again. Just making sure that it's the processes are consistent because that's going to tell you at least relatively how how it's being affected. No. Yep. Um, great, great question. Uh, is there is there a big difference in seam quality between LOE Super N and, and CDL? I, ideally, no. Um, they'll all have their own their own seam um, seam specs and proper tooling. As long as the end quality is good, as long as the um, the the seamer and the tooling quality is good, um, one shouldn't be producing a better seam than another. The the CDL and Super N were introduced as a as a cost saving measure. Uh, they use less aluminum. Um, they're slightly lightweighted, and they're profiled differently than the LOEs to just you know use a, a, a fraction of a gram less aluminum per per end, and um, it does it does impact the cost. Our our cost, and we you know what we sell pallets of super ends at is about a tenth of a cent less per per end, and it may not be a ton you know for for most breweries, but you know with Coke and Pepsi doing you know billions a year, it does it does add up. Um, but no, there, there shouldn't be any difference in, in seam quality as long as it's, uh, you know, good, good tooling and, and the appropriate seam specs are being used. Yep. 
That, that's, that's another good question. What, what about supply chain related to LOE, SuperN, CDL Plus? So SuperNs are proprietary to, to Crown. Um, so they technically, they should be the only ones manufacturing them. And they have heavily, heavily invested in, in the SuperN. So uh, from Crown, yes, we've seen better supply chain on, on SuperNs than, than LOEs. Um, Crown is more open to doing any um, customization on super ends. They'll do colored tabs, for example, at single pallet quantities, where if we want colored tab LOEs, we have to order a full truckload, which is like 8 million uh, units. So um, we don't really have anybody who wants 8 million of, uh, you know, a colored tab uh, for the most part. So, uh, you know, any customization like colored tabs, uh, gold or black shells, um, it's easier for us to get in, in a Super N than an LOE for sure. Um, in terms of the other manufacturers, um, I, I'd say forecasting is key for any, you know, anybody buying from them, whether it's a brewery direct or, or distributor. Um, if you tell your manufacturer that you need X number of LOEs or X number of Super Ns or, or CDLs, they should be able to say that they can produce that. But uh, with Crown specifically, super, the Super N supply chain is definitely uh, more, I'd say, more secure than than the LOEs. They have more plants that produce it, um, and and typically run quite a bit more versus the LOE. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, off the top, it's the, the seams uh, are rated for about 95 PSI, which again, depending on the temperature, is gonna translate to some number of volumes. But it, yeah, it depends on what, what temperature you're, you're measuring at. But I'd say roughly about 90, you know, 95 PSI, you don't wanna get much higher than that. Yeah, so the can supply situation in general. Uh, all, all, yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, things have really, really opened up uh, recently. There was, you know, back in 2018 or so, we had the, the pandemic and there were just no cans on the market. And then things started to get stabilized a little bit. And then the seltzers hit and, you know, White Claw took all the cans available from the market and then the pandemic hit. And then there were no cans for, for you know, a year and a half, two years. Uh, now we're kind of seeing a... a kind of a, a, I'd say an overcorrection to that where um, Ball is actually shutting down lines and plants um, because they're under, they're under capacity. So um, partly due to, you know, the market, I'd say correcting from on-premise and, you know, in COVID shifting back to, back to um, uh, sorry, to off-premise shifting back to on-premise um, is part of it. And then the seltzer category not growing at the same rate um, that it was growing at. So a couple manufacturers, uh, Ball and Ardaw, had massive, massive contracts uh, for White Claw and Truly, uh, especially in sleek cans. And they're not buying what they said they would. So, so now there's all this capacity on the market and you'll see them somewhat clearing out cans. Um, so I'd say as a, as a can consumer, it's, it's definitely a, a good market to be, to be sourcing in. Uh, is this going to last forever? Uh, probably not. Everything, everything, you know, it, it is cyclical. Um, right now, there are no tariffs on aluminum going across the, the Canada-U.S. border. Um, there's no tariff on us bringing in cans from the U.S. or sending cans that were produced in Canada uh, to the U.S. The U.S. is still imposing uh, tariffs on Chinese cans and NNs, which is why we're seeing more Chinese cans and NNs on, on the market here. Um, but the fact is, domestic supply is is pretty solid. Uh, there is there is no you know serious reason why um, anything should be coming in from from overseas, especially with you know freight has not corrected the same way can supply has. So um, you know we definitely see um, you know some suppliers bringing in um, cans and ends from from overseas, but uh, there is, there is enough domestic supply and and. Prices will will correct. Uh, prices has have been correcting over this year. Um, we've seen some significant drops in 
aluminum commodity uh, pricing, which has, has led to decreases in our cost. Uh, just to, I guess, share a little bit on how the sausage is made. So um, our, our cost from Crown is, is adjusted four times a year. Um, once at the very start of the year, um, based on aluminum over the last quarter, but also an inflationary uh, measure. And then every quarter for Q2, Q3, Q4, there's an adjustment based on the average aluminum cost from the past quarter. So it's, it should be pretty predictable to see where can prices are going based on those factors. So inflation has, has been going up, so we definitely expect that we're going to see upward pressure on our pricing because of that. Aluminum has been dropping, so we'll see downward pressure because of that. So going from now to Q1, there may be an increase because of inflation and that outpacing the drop in aluminum, but then for the rest of the year, it really should follow aluminum pricing. Absolutely, uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, so Vessel was acquired by Tricor Braun uh, right at the start of uh, this year. Uh, Tricor is a, a major multinational um, uh, rigid and flexible uh, packaging supplier. Um, we have not seen very much change on a on a day to day basis. Um, Vessel is still operating uh, independently. Uh, you know, the only difference is is Matt uh, Leslie now has a boss, which uh, it was probably a good thing uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're definitely looking at, at how we can improve the way we deliver things um, by being a part of the Tricor family. Uh, one is honestly, Vessel is not a, you know, we're not a logistics organization. Um, Tricor is. So, so we're taking advantage of some of the, the freight programs that they have to make sure that we're moving cans more, more effectively. Um, I think I've been told that I am out of time, um, but I will, uh, I'll be downstairs. I think we're booth 45, 46. If anybody has any other questions, uh, please come find me. And uh, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Yeah. Here we get to oh. present you my yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. Another hand for Evan. Um, so just so there's enough time, if you have other questions, you can come up. You can catch them in the trade show floor or come up here. Uh, we just want to give everybody time to get to the next session. So there will be a, another session in this room at uh, 145, 245. Yeah. So 10 minutes from now. Um, but there's coffee and everything outside. And I believe still beer, because who would we be if there wasn't? Enjoy. What's that? I've not had a beer.